evening everyone my name is Eric Tandon once again to Indo-Canada Chambers Thursday talks one of the most exciting discussions that everyone has been talking and waiting for is finding about travel and we call today's event to be travel a new beginning we have heard a lot about what is going on across the world we have excellent panelists today we have amazing audience listening to us worldwide. Let's proceed on that. Please, Karen. As we see right now, what is the situation where we are? Means our lockdown is already through. Have we seen the worst behind us? Yes, probably it is. The economy is now going to revive itself. Coming out of the hibernation, that's the focus right now for the travel sector. And it's the biggest challenge that we are going to face. We will embark on new journeys to make sure this sector survives and takes the stage there where it truly belongs. Major sectors that are being focused right now are the attraction, airlines, domestic travel, international travel, cruises, restaurants, hotels, events. Everything gets impacted with travel when it stops. So the airlines and the travel industry is not just airlines, it's complete whole that we look into. Thank you, Karen. Next one. We also want to let you know what Chamber has done from our side. Now, Indo-Canada Chamber is one of the oldest ethnic chamber in Canada. What we have done, knowing what is going on, we work with small businesses. So what we started was the counseling system, work with our small businesses to make sure they have assistance available. So Chamber doors are available. Any small business that needs assistance, they can get in touch with our Chamber by sending an email to ICCC at ICCConline.org and make sure in your heading you mention small business assist program. You can always give us a call. You will get an email coming back to you quickly as possible from one of our colleagues, and then we will take care of that. There is no charge from that. This is on pro bono basis. Our chamber is dedicated not just to our members, but also to the entire community which is running the small businesses. Now We have an amazing panel today. And let me tell you what we have with us today is great Yuvraj Datta, who has joined us from US, and I will introduce him in a few moments. We have Richard Smart from Canada, from Tico, he has joined us as well. Mr. Sandeep Chaudhary, thank you very much, in the middle of the night, joining us from India. He's joined us here. Mr. Chris Robinson, who runs the Chris Robinson Show. So we have great audience as well listening, but we will start with our program. So this is giving you a rundown on the program. We'll have Mr. Pramod Goel, who will do the hot talk. We call it the hard talk because he's a financial guy. So he'll be asking you some amazing questions and that we will take them out of the way before we go into industry questions. That program, that part of the session will be run by me. And then foreign, immediately after that, we'll be going into Q&A, the questions that you as audience can come and ask us through our Facebook Live. If you have not joined us yet, please make sure you spread the word. Let everyone come online and listen to us. And please make sure you read our disclaimer that is available even on our website. Listen to this video after that as well, that Indo-Canada Chamber is making sure this is facilitated for our members, the audience, to get information. And the views on this coming from, from individuals who are giving their opinions. Thank you very much on that. Thank you, Karen. Now, let me take this moment because this is my pride. I am from the industry. I've spent a lot of time. And it gives me a great pleasure to introduce the first person is Yuvraj Datta. Now, let me give you a quick thing on Yuvraj. Yuvraj has been in Canada for a long time. He started a journey from Canada. He has been managing companies in Canada as the consolidation. But today, he's the chief commercial officer for Mondi Group, which is the largest group of consolidation in the world. He's joining us from US. Yuvraj, please go ahead and say us a few things about yourself. Thanks, AJ, and uh, thank you, everybody, to joining us uh, on this new beginning. Uh, I firmly believe that it's a, it's a great forum to talk about. More importantly, about me and us, uh, I'm Yuvraj Tata. I'm an Indian by heart, lived over 20 years in Canada, and from last four years, I'm heading this group as a commercial head from San Francisco. We at Amondi, we are we are 95% of our revenue comes from our travel agents group. That's, that's our biggest business. And uh, just to give you a little bit about us as a group, 
We are $4 billion in sales revenue with 45 locations across the world. We have offices in Canada. We have uh, four offices in Canada. We have around 41 offices in US. And then we also have our presence across the globe. We have a presence in India, a big one. We also have a presence in Bangkok, Athens, and Costa Rica. As a company, uh, we are basically, uh, people know us as consolidators, but we have pivoted ourselves more to a distribution and technology. We feel that without technology, there is uh, no tomorrow. In fact, there's no today as well. So certainly, uh, I personally, myself, uh, one of my mentors used to say that he's born in ticket jacket. So now it's, uh, I'll say, e-ticket. So we are the e-tickets of the world. We started our career in, in travel way back, around 25 years back. And, uh, and now we are still continuing. But I say we have pivoted in technology, and we see that the real solution for us is in a combination of human and technology together in a hybrid. And we will talk today a little bit about it in the near future. Thank you, AJ, and thank you, Pramochi, for, for organizing this. And uh, uh, very thankful for ICCC to organize some, some events like this. Thank you. Over to AJ. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Raj. I mean, it's um, amazing uh, that you mentioned about technology. We are here because of technology, and tomorrow technology will change the world. It is already changing every second. And we look forward to uh, your part of the story as well. A lot of questions will be coming to you because you look after the travel agents, which is the market we'll be talking on that as well. But talking about travel agents, let's look into an authority that actually makes sure that the customer's interest is taken care of. That is very important in Canada, and especially in Ontario, where it is regulated. I'm so delighted to have uh, with us Richard Smart, who is the president and CEO of uh, Tico. TICO is a regulatory body and making sure that the interest of passengers is very prime importance. Richard, please tell us a little bit about TICO and yourself as well. That'll be great for our audience. AJ, thank you uh, to you and Pramrud for this wonderful opportunity to, talk, to, have, to, to be here with such an, uh, an esteemed panel and for your viewers around the world. Um, I, I wanted to take a second just to uh, acknowledge the Indo-Canadian and local communities in which our members conduct business. Uh, it's such a vibrant and, and important uh, sector for the Canadian and international economies, um, and it's really a privilege to be here with you today. Uh, the Travel Industry Council of Ontario, or TICO as we're better known as, we are Ontario's travel regulator. We're an extension of the Ontario government, and we, we exist to, prov to provide consumer protection around the important travel decisions that consumers make today uh, for both leisure purchases and business travel. And we're agnostic to whether it's domestic or international. Travel is a, is a wonderful thing. And, and as you said, we are, are here to uh, provide oversight over uh, consumer protection uh, here in, in Ontario and Canada. Uh, tico has been around since 1997. Uh, while we're a creation of the Ontario government, uh, we too have an independent board of directors and we operate similar to any other business. We're a not-for-profit organization. We're funded 100% by industry. We have great industry partners and the success of the travel sector has direct bearing on our success, uh, both financially and operationally. But our mandate, as you said, is squarely focused on consumer protection, but we also are extremely supportive of an effective and efficient uh, travel industry through engagement and ed education of, of all our members. Um, we regulate, or I like to say, we provide oversight over 2,300 travel agencies and tour operators uh, in the province. We've certified more than 77,000 travel advisors over the past decade. Um, and importantly, we, we, we don't regulate airlines. This is left to the, to the federal government, which thankfully I, I might add is, is, is with my federal partners. Um, but at TICO, we license, we monitor, we inspect agencies to ensure they're following the rules. Uh, we take consumer complaints when they do come in, and we actively try to work with consumers and registrants to, to come to, to, to come to our resolution. We have an industry finance compensation fund, which is available to reimburse consumers. Um, if there is a failure of a registrant, an airline or a cruise line, uh, touch wood, there hasn't been a lot of that in, in recent times, and we're uh, we're optimistic we're, we're going to get through this pandemic and with the with the help of um, all our members and, and consumers and, and industry uh, we hope to minimize the pain for for everyone 
Um, well, not often the case. We, as a regulator, we have the authority to delay charges and levy fines um, to individuals and corporations, but this is not TECO's modus operandi. We're a patient a regulator, we like to work uh, with our uh, uh, members uh, to, to come to a successful resolution. But in summary, our role is one of consumer awareness and education, and we're looking forward to, to getting through this pand pandemic. It will pass, and it's through um, um, a collaboration and, uh, and, and discussion uh, and working together that we'll get through this. So I'm looking forward to our dialogue today and, and sharing ideas regarding how we uh, move through this pandemic and get a, get uh, get back to better times. So thank you. Talk about that a few moments, but I also have the opportunity now to introduce a person who is right now midnight past two o'clock in the morning for tomorrow, Mr. Sandeep Roy Chaudhary, who is the general manager for Commercial Headquarters, just retired recently with Air India. He was instrumental in starting flights recently into Canada. And he's the person who is right now sitting there making sure the expat expatriation flights which are running from India. So we thank you. Sandeep, uh, first and foremost, thank you very much for joining us. Early morning hours, please, uh, your few words about uh, your introduction a little bit, please. Thank you, Ajay. It's a pleasure being with you all today. And um, for the viewers, I'm Sandeep Roy Chaudhary. I started my career way back uh, with Steel Authority of India in the year 1984. And subsequently, in 1988, I joined Air India in the commercial department. And uh, it's been my good fortune that I was able to get exposure in the various sections of commercial department, right from cargo, both flight handling as well as sales, passenger flight handling and sales. And I also had the good fortune of being posted abroad in Hong Kong, Tokyo, Washington, D.C. And I also did some short postings to start new flights in San Francisco, and as Ajay recently as Ajay mentioned, that uh, just last year we started our flights, non-stop flights from Toronto to Delhi. And uh, it's uh, really great to tell you that both the flights are doing exceedingly well, and uh, we I do look forward to talking more about it uh, with you in the course of the program. And Air India by itself doesn't need any introduction, but just to give you a brief on it, that we are uh, one of the largest airlines in the in our country and uh, servicing over 40 international destinations and uh, about uh, 60 to 65 domestic destinations within India. And we have a fleet of close to 130 aircraft. So that's about it, Ajay, from our side. The rest, when we get on with the program. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Sandeep, very much. Um, last but definitely not the least is one of my uh, colleagues in the industry, as I call him, man who makes sure that everything comes out in light for everyone always a smiling face but also great friend of indo-canadian community he's always seen at 15th august he has traveled many times to india as well please uh, join me in welcoming chris robinson from the chris robinson uh, travel show chris please go ahead thank you aj and uh, welcome to the chris robinson travel show ah uh, sorry old habits die hard what can i say <laughs> Uh, yes, I'm, I'm Chris Robinson. I'm, uh, as far as the travel industry is concerned, I'm a little bit of a poacher turned gamekeeper because after a geography degree at Cambridge in the UK, I launched into a, a corporate career in the travel sector in Europe and North America for 25 years or so. And I headed up the, uh, the marketing teams for large tour operators such as Thomson Holidays and First Choice in the UK and Signature and SunQuest here in Canada, and as well as roles with Avis, Europe, Middle East and Africa, and Citicor. My roles were always essentially to talk about um, the joys of travel, to market the joys of travel, which is really what I've been doing now for my last 20 years or so as an independent entrepreneur travel media specialist, hosting and producing Canada's most popular travel show on radio, as we like to say. Um, my role continues to be persuading people of the joys of travel. And uh, yes, I have a, a real affinity for, for India. I, I first traveled there as a backpacking student in the, uh, in the 1970s. Um, most recently in 2014, I recorded a, uh, an on-location travel show in, in Northern India. And uh, this March, middle of March, I saw the coast of India again. I was 
so close, but it was a near miss. I didn't get to to land, and perhaps we'll be talking a little bit more about that uh, later on in the webinar. I'm very much looking forward, uh, of course, to exchanging uh, our views with my fellow panelists and perhaps receiving some questions too from, from those listening in. It's a hugely important uh, uh, topic, and uh, thank you very much indeed for inviting me. Thank you so much, uh, Chris, uh, and we look forward to having a great discussion with everyone in a few moments. Now I take the opportunity to introduce you, uh, my colleague uh, on board and our president, which is Mr. Pramod Goyal. Now, uh, Mr. Pramod Goyal is, is one, uh, one great person to be around. He's always looking for something new. He's always looking to make sure things get better from where they are. So for him, it is one of the most frustrating, but also one of the most exciting times because the pandemic has made him absolutely making sure that every nook and corner is taken care of and everything becomes better. But he's also from the financial background, so he will look after the hot talk now. Pramod, please go ahead and um, start with your amazing discussions with our colleagues. Pramod is still on mute. Karan. Thank you, Ajay. Good afternoon, gentlemen. Welcome. And thank you <clears throat> for taking the time to be with us on this webinar. A very warm welcome to all those who are connected with us this afternoon. As we've all been talking uh, in our introductions, uh, we notice many countries are now entering a new phase in uh, fighting the virus, uh, seeing the re relaxation of lockdown norms, while at the same time uh, managing the reopening of the travel and tourism economy besides other industry segments. This is going to be a complex and challenging task and quantifying the impact on tourism sector, specifically if we talk about, is very, very difficult. We look at revised scenarios, uh, which indicate that the implied shock could amount to 60 to 80 percent decline in the international tourism economy in 2020 itself, depending on the duration of the crisis and the speed with which the travel and tourism would rebound. Tourism generates foreign exchange, it drives regional development, directly supports numerous types of jobs and businesses, and underpins many local communities. If we just look at the OECD countries, the sector directly contributes slightly less than 5% of the GDP and over 21% of the service exports. The numbers are pretty significant. Now, in terms of what is happening, let's uh, have input from our esteemed panelists. To start with, I'll uh, start with uh, Richard, uh, as you are the regulator of over 2,400 travel retailers and wholesalers in Ontario. TCO's mandate, uh, as I understand, is to ensure smoother interaction between consumers and council members. But in the post-pandemic environment, the industry will also be needing organized lobbying to be able to fully become functional and operational. So the question is, what sort of a broad plan does TICO have to help the sector jumpstart and grow out of the downslide? Thank you, uh, uh, Pamela. That's a, that's a great question. Um, we have uh, been engaging with both the consumers and our registrants uh, very closely over the last uh, number of months since the, pit, uh, since the pandemic uh, accelerated. Um, and at TICO, although our, our role is primarily around the consumer protection, uh, we look to our industry registrants as our ambassadors to consumer protection. Um, uh, the relationship between uh, registrants and their consumers is, is a very vital one, and we think consumer protection is part of that business equation. Uh, consumer protection is good business. So our, our plans over uh, have been over the last few months and will continue to be taking a very active role in engaging consumers, uh, being there to respond to their, 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 their concerns, their frustrations, 
their their quest for information on on where to go, what's next, what are their consumer uh, protection rights, and at the same time work with uh, with registrants who are effectively uh, working with uh, zero turnover uh, right now and having to manage uh, burn uh, uh, burn rates and, and overhead um, um, expenses in in the, in the very very. Um, difficult time. So our role is really trying to be flexible, uh, trying to be patient uh, with uh, with our registrants, uh, trying to help them through uh, this um, uh, this journey over, over the over the recovery period. And we're doing that through uh, looking at the regulations, uh, looking for ways we can assist them financially, uh, looking for ways that we can take a leadership role to talk about the. Um, a very vital and important role that travel agencies and tour operators have in the both the general economy, but but particularly in the travel sector, um, and and being there to support uh, that, uh, that agency and tour operator network. Thank you, uh, sir. But uh, as you mentioned, I mean more of a regulatory role for your organization. So specifically, when we talk about SMEs and the smaller businesses that are involved in travel industry, so do you think uh, there is something in terms of policy changes from the government that uh, would you would like to see as an organization that could ensure a hastened recovery and return to pre-pandemic uh, levels? Anything specifically in terms of policy changes? Well, you know, we're we're right in the in the in the middle of this pandemic, and, and we know that the old uh, supply chain management for travel is, is going to change. Um, and uh, we're engaging the uh, our local government um, and registrants in a dialogue as to what those policy changes may look like. Uh, but but I think it's fair to say that the way um, travel was was purchased and consumed in the past has got to change. We've got to rebuild the trust that we have with consumers, and I know the uh, Ontario government and the federal, all levels of government are very interested at looking at those policy changes. I think they will will be in the areas of um, of the oversight that, that we have over over the registrant network, uh, over the uh, financial um, uh, oversight that that we provide, uh, looking at the insurance uh, industry and how insurance provides. Uh, a solution to to make uh, travel more uh, more safe and, and effective. So we haven't pinpointed the exact policy changes, other than to say that there, there needs to be a change to, to those policies. We're very much in a listening mode right now, um, and we did come out uh, at the end of March, uh, at the beginning of the pandemic, uh, with some regulatory changes to provide that initial burden relief. Uh, but the dialogue, I would say, is really at the early stages right now. And we're engaging industry at all levels to, to, to come to the table uh, with um, with ideas around how we can change that policy set moving forward. So it's very much a working process. Thank you. So if we talk about uh, the way the business is to be conducted now going forward is going to change. So let's talk about technology and then uh, I'll uh, move on to you, Raj, uh, to ask this question. Uh, so Monday Inc, where you are the uh, chief operating officer, is on the cutting edge of technological innovation in the travel sector. And as, as we know, the travel sector is dominated by small businesses who have resource constraint. Now, in the, given the post-pandemic scenario, costs associated with the prevention or changes to the work processes or uh, adopting new digital tools and implementation uh, might be a cost which is kind of difficult to absorb for a lot of SMEs. So the question would be, would this lead to an overhaul of the sector with more consolidation and or eventual disappearance of the small businesses from the sector? Pramod, thank you for, I think it's a very, uh, I, I really like the name Hard Talk. It's it's a really, very right and more importantly, the the very crude on, you know, a raw subject. I appreciate you taking it up uh, right in front. What we think, and let me just, just kind of a little bit step back. It's not only for small businesses. It's equally hard for the bigger businesses as well, as well as medium businesses. But I will certainly talk about the small businesses because they matter to us the most because they are the one who made us. So what we feel, in fact, uh, I'll just, uh, when this pandemic happened, 
the first thing which we did, we, we are institutionally funded company. So we made sure that we have a financial stability for us. And we've taken all the right measures at that time, and we are taking it now to reduce our cash burn and to make sure that we are in a healthy shape. Because it's not the problem of today. The problem is actually yet to come. Because right now, most of our employees and many of the people have been supported by funding through the government. And we, in the, in the whole supply chain of travel, are utilizing those. And those are going to dry up soon, maybe next month or next to next month. And the real battle is going to start after. So what we are planning, so as we were planning not only to make sure that we sustain, we have actually started a whole initiative called MARS, uh, Mondi Assistance and, re and the Relief Program for Travel Agencies, which we're going to roll down shortly. And in fact, today, this is the first forum we are talking about it. We firmly believe it in our supply chain. As much as the existence of airline and consumer, the interest of consumer to travel is important, the, the, the two intermediary parts, in this supply chain, a travel agent and supplier is also need to survive, survive today. And it's very difficult in today's environment. So what we are planning and offering, so what we, are, what we feel is that it's a time right now for everybody to relook into the way they, they operate it. They have to look into some fixed cost to make it a variable cost. And, uh, and I'm, I'm just going to highlight, and we're, we are actually working on those programs live. And there are some already some proof of concepts in place right now as we speak, which basically enable a travel agent to focus on their core strength, which is interacting with consumer and more importantly, making sure that they, they address the need of a consumer, which is a traveler. Mm -hmm. And then the other things comes in, in terms to the, you know, as devils are always in details, the other thing comes is that how they process those things, how they procure the best content, how they transact, how they do that. That's where the technology comes in and we come in. And what our offerings will be that they will be able to convert their current business model the way they are doing it today. Uh, we are offering a help in terms of making their many of the work virtually and kind of making moving their fixed cost to some variable cost. So let's say I'll just give you a sample example and it's just, just for our conversation purposes. So it's just for illustration I'm saying. There is an agency of 10 staff today and they were they are doing great in 2019, but in 2020, first quarter, they got hit. And now they don't know when the business is going to come back. Do they need 10 people? Do they need eight? Do they need five? Or just owner and maybe two people are required there. So they have no idea about it. So in our program, what we are telling them is they can slow start. They can start with the core people. And then whatever services they need, they can basically join this program, Mars, and they can kind of use the Mars facility to facilitate all the services. So they don't pay a fixed cost of a, of a person, like a salary of five people or four people, they pay per transaction. So, and then we also kind of give them a technology for free, what we have available. So not only that they, they work with us, and it's not just limited that if they have to buy from us. So we are kind of elevating ourselves that it is just not making sure that it is for Mondi. It is not only for Mondi or any of our brand. We have six big brands in North America, but this is for pretty much we are offering it to every travel agent in, in right now, and this is the plan. So that makes sure that they can take advantage of this. So this is beyond a brand, beyond a community, beyond a market. This is an effort actually focusing especially on small and medium-sized travel agent to survive in this pandemic. And now we have a very simple focus in that program. That program has a focus of first survive and thrive. And, and I actually take this analogy in a very difficult way. You know, it's a very tough time. It's very difficult. But in our industry, technology is, is very deprived. I worked 25 years, and before uh, I joined this company, around 20 years back, I was president of Skylink in Canada. We have seen that we were so busy in our day-to-day -day routines that it's very hard for us to take a pause. And I'm not speaking for myself. I'm speaking for many colleagues of mine who I know today will be watching on this live show. When they come to their office, they're just so busy in their day-to-day -day routine, handling phones and making their you know, uh, ends of their life meet, that they don't have a time to think what is required for their business to, to adopt in technology and what they needs to be done. And even if some of us are able to do, it's very hard to get what is exactly good for their business. And even after this, they all do this, all these things, then the other biggest part, where do they bring these funds from? Because in their own respective size, they cannot afford this thing at a technology cost. 
So in this all, it's, it's basically, we, we don't have just one single reason to pinpoint of our situation where we are today, but there are multiple reasons. So what we feel is it's an opportunity. It's like, you know, a racing car moving with a hundred or just a car moving with a hundred miles an hour. And we have to change its wheels or do, do their, uh, you know, service. We can't. So today, unfortunately or fortunately, we are at a pause. So it's a very good time for all my colleagues to think how it is a reality. We have to think differently. The way we have, what we learned in last many, many decades being in the industry is as good as yesterday. We had to learn the new means. So first talking about the economics and just surviving, it's very important. We have to see the way we conduct business. Is it really that or can we work with more efficient and innovative ways? And, and there are many. And, and we have opened up that forum so we, we can talk about it. And this is one of the initiative too. So we believe there will be not only by us and it's, it's open for everybody, for my peers. Uh, we are not just making it just a company specific, it's industry specific. And we'll be more than happy to assist anybody from the chamber or from the industry who come and wants to have it available. So we are, we are trying to work out this program. So where more importantly, they basically move their fixed cost to a variable cost. Then more importantly, empower them with the technology, what they need, so that they can become a more efficient business post-COVID. And that's very critical for all of us. Sure. Uh, <clears throat> thank you. My compliment for the initiatives that you've taken. Thank you. Uh, uh, moving on to, let me ask Sandeep. I think he's sitting quiet. Uh, Sandeep, we noticed that uh, domestic air travel in India has uh, started uh, recently, but though very cautiously with the government, uh, you know, trying to uh, have some control on the pricing uh, in the initial months of the domestic travel that was opened up. Uh, so what has been the experience uh, of the industry so far? And will it lead to a fully operational air sector soon within at least India? Uh, and with some of the international flights coming in, what's your take on from an Indian perspective? Um, addressing your domestic sector first. Uh, uh, you see, we have started to various uh, uh, cities in India. And uh, one of the major uh, problems that the passengers are facing, and naturally, is, you know, the various states having their own quarantine uh, rules, uh, which are in place. But yes, there has been, uh, um, it has been uh, uh, very welcomed by the passengers because you see the lockdown in India was clamped all of a sudden and people were stuck at various places, you know, and uh, they all wanted to get back to their, um, their homes and place of work. Uh, but uh, the, so the moment they got the opportunity of traveling and air definitely gives the most convenient way of getting from one place to the other. So they did jump at it. But after this phase, it all depends on how this COVID unfolds, you know, how we are able to get a grip on this. Because just now the people have moved because it is, you know, it is a question of almost survival when they think about meeting their own people and going back to their homes. So it is a very different scenario for why the people have traveled just now. But uh, I'm quite optimistic because you see, to tackle COVID, you know, there are three things which are required. We need efficient testing, we need a vaccine, or we need a cure. Now, if we see the testing part of it, there's a lot of changes and a lot of progress has been made on it. Earlier, the you know the reports would come in in a couple of days' time or three days' time, four days' time. Today, it is down to a matter of hours, and even in some places, they're doing it in minutes. Now, if we get, if this thing uh, really, so if we are able to be a success at even the testing part of it, then I think the airline can and the travel industry can get over this challenge because you see we have faced various other challenges in the past. Earlier, security used to be a breeze. There was hardly any security at the airport. People would just walk through. But today when you look at security, there's so many processes involved. You know? And if we can get a grip on the testing part of it, then it may add another about three, four, five minutes to the check-in and the uh, process of, you know, checking in and going right up to the aircraft. Mm -hmm. So it all depends. A lot of uncertain uh, factors are there. 
and uh, if we can get a you know we can make a breakthrough on any of these the testing part of it the vaccine part of it or the prevention i think only after that we will be able to say with a, a degree of certainty that how the travel business is going to be for sure i mean yeah everything is uncertain so far yeah <clears throat> thank you uh Chris, uh, since I'm running behind my time, let me ask you uh, a question before I hand over back to AJ. Uh, you, you run a popular travel show. For you, I, I would just uh, keep a broader question. Uh, while tourism, as we're speaking about, is heavily impacted by the pandemic, a uh, lot of measures have been put in place to contain the virus or to you know uh, take care of other issues. But as we also understand, if we were talking about reviving the tourism and the travel flows, uh, it is important to open up. But uh, additional tourism can also be a potential vector for spreading the virus. So it's kind of a catch-22 situation. So how deeply with this uh, dilemma to choose between being safe and or to begin uh, you know, opening up the economy and loud travel. So what is your take on this? <laughs> well, thank you for lobbing the hardest talk question at me. <laughs> there is no definitive answer, of course, that can be given to that. It is a very, very subtle balance that's going to have to be uh, taken. And it's going to be taken, of course, at many different government levels, uh, different uh, tourism body levels and different tourism organization levels. And that's what's going to make it so complex, I think, for the, the traveling consumer and why it's going to be such a challenge to get the, the travelers back um, on uh, long distance travel in particular, but also on, on cross-border travel of any kind in the near future. Uh, the key question, which none of us can answer here, of course, is uh, about the availability of a vaccine when, where, how effective. That will change everything. Um, as listeners to, to my show will know, I'm almost always wearing my rose-tinted specs. I'm almost always positive. But I do have to put them aside just in the short to medium term, because I don't think it's going to be a very easy future in the next 12 months for the travel sector as a whole. Uh, yes, we're beginning to see some opening up now. But I think we're going to see some closing down equally quickly. We're seeing record levels of infection in the United States. Um, even Europe is coming back with, with some, some higher numbers. Um, it's not a good environment for planning how you're going to deploy planes, how you're going to deploy cruise ships, and how you're going to market uh, a, a vacation, which may entail wearing a mask, for instance, on, on board both planes and even cruise ships. So I think that the, the challenge will be being very flexible to, uh, to bring people back. I think it will demand honesty and clarity from everyone involved and some consistency too, which is not what we're seeing at the moment. Uh, it seems to me that every country, every receiving country has got different um, uh, requirements for, for travelers who may or may not be coming in. And some, of course, like Hong Kong, you know, have just said, we are not going to have international visitors until September. Um, others, as you say, are opening up and trying to tilt that balance that you spoke about more in favor of restarting the, the tourism businesses, which uh, they're so reliant upon. Now, nowhere more so perhaps than in the Caribbean. But even in the Caribbean, we're seeing demands for incoming tourists to have uh, either COVID uh, test certificates or um requirements for testing on arrival um one country now cambodia in uh, southeast asia has also said it wants a three thousand dollar us um deposit for all travelers coming into the country to cover any covid related incidents that might be attached to their their travel including their funeral well that's not a great way to attract uh new new travelers so in the short term it's going to be a very very rough ride Thank you, Chris. Uh, I think uh, we are running slightly behind. So, AJ, I'll hand it over back to you to continue the discussion. Thank you, all of you, for taking my questions. Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Pramod. I uh, really appreciate that. Um, like I said, 
you have to face the hard, hard questions first, and it's going to be a smooth ride. Well, it, well, guess what? You're in for a surprise. We are now going to be right into the travel sector to look into what the hard facts and how we can um, revive it from our point of view at what points we have. Uh, Karen, I have a small video. Can we play that first for us, please? The reason I asked for this video, please have a look at the figures which are showing you saw that 2019, the same time coming in all the way from April to June, how the flight were looking over Europe. This was just produced a few days back and um, I had to hack it in and get it from the Euro control to make sure I get this. So we thank you Euro control for giving us the exact situation on what's happening in Europe. So if you look into how the flights were shown, it clearly shows us where we stand right now. Um, in listening to uh, our uh, CEO and the president form or the Attorney general at the um, um, IATA, they mentioned uh, last week, um, Mr. Alexander uh, jean Beck, he mentioned that our lowest point probably was April. That's what he felt. From May, things started moving forward. In June, you can see Europe is showing signs of improvement. Airlines took a dip all the way to 95% in the second quarter. And we expect, and as per their expectations, and if you listen to Brian Pierce, who's the chief economist, he mentioned that we probably will finish the year at about 36%. That is in case we don't get the second wave. That's there. But on the other hand, if you look into cargo, cargo saw a major in increase. We went up by about 24% maybe because of the capacity shortage as well, but still they went up. So while everybody else was down, they were moving around uh, medical supplies. Our total revenue that comes into the aviation industry is 15% from cargo. Now the second quarter, the burn already cash burn done by the airlines is over $60 billion. And we expect in the future, the fuel cost is not the one which you should be worried about, all the other things that will be going around it the overall handling of the flights will delay. So there's a lot going on at the airports when the flights. Now we, I personally believe that the airlines play a major role in economic recovery for anyone because they become the bridges to make sure the investments, tourism start flowing for the proper economic growth. And I want to start my questions straight away with Yuvraj. Yuvraj, you are coming from the technology side of it and 2019 was a year of technology. And airlines were coming out, so we are going to be talking some of the lingos from the airline side, but I will explain them as well. Airlines were in making sure the NDC, which is the new distribution capabilities, allowing all the units from what they have the capabilities to the agencies, and you were at the forefront of it to carrying them. Now, Mondi Group was sitting at the center stage in North America to make sure that takes over, because not all the airlines were there, a lot of airlines from Europe and uh, US were there. But now looking into the industry that has taken a major jolt in 2020, airlines will lose over $84 billion. Revenues for 2020, like I said, have gone down to 50% to 419 billion from 830 billion was in 2019. So that's a major. So now asking your question, how has your mindset towards North America domestic, cross-border and international changed? And in what steps will the industry move forward? <coughs> travel, corporate travel, tourism. I request you to keep it concise for all our viewers. Thank you. Sure. It is certainly absolutely right that there is a big effort done by IATA over the last many years and really rallied the airlines to follow the protocol. And everybody started participating in it, and there are different stages of NDC. And in, as I said a few minutes back with Pramod, that you know things have changed so much that right now everybody is in a survival mode. So certainly, yes, those things have been, I'll say, it parked. But uh, in in our overall industry level, there are things has been parked for now. But as a Mondi, what we have done and what we are doing right now as well, we are taking this time to basically make sure that we are we are available for the post covid and right now we are connecting uh, and we are we are actually not only connecting the scheduled carriers we are also trying to connect even the the low cost carriers also <clears throat> because the name of the game is going to change really after the pandemic 
and we want all our uh, industry, uh, or all people who work with us, our customers, be a, get that opportunity to get that. We are also, we were working on both sides on NDC as well as NGS, new generation platform for, for distribution. We were working on both sides to make people aware. So certainly we are working still. We have not dropped the ball, but it has been a little bit prioritized. Prioritization has come to some other projects like Mars and more importantly, to make sure that we will offer a virtual product for travel agents to use. So they don't need to carry their, their you know, GDS is across and they should be more mobile. They can log in from a laptop or from an iPad and they will be able to work more flexible. And as the industry has to change overall, I think there will be a more role of individuals to participate in the travel program at their pace. <clears throat> Something like what Uber has brought in a, in a taxi industry, there will be those kind of initiative uh, is going to come in our industry. These are new ways of looking into it when people who have expertise on the industry can spend their specific time. So we, 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 we are looking into those kind of modules as well. So there is a lot of uh, things have changed and we, we are also thinking of basically making sure we are part of uh, that program. But more, one more question you asked, can you, can you repeat your one of the other questions which you asked in terms of after NDC? You asked me two questions, uh, one after another. You're on mute. Travel, corporate travel and uh, tourism side, you are handling all of it. In what stages you think they will be coming to light? How will they move forward? Yeah, you also added about domestic and transborder travel about it. So <clears throat> domestic and domestic travel, just to give you some stats on, on that is, Right now, airlines are flying around 10%, 5 to 8% of their schedule. And, and right now in their capacity, because they are following the social distancing, they are going around 60% of their load right now. So the, that's on the domestic side. There's no transborder other than only the emergency flights where you know <clears throat> the citizens of one country can go back to their country. So borders are not open. So it's, it's very impactful. And in fact, we have requested Canadian government to open the bridges with us but we can understand it's not us as yesterday only has the highest single day 37.9 almost 38000 new cases registered yesterday so as what uh, uh, chris was also saying it's it's a, it's a lot of uncertainty here and, and and we respect the government's decision why they are not opening up that fast as we expected to but I think they have now say they will review it on 21st of July. So we are very optimistic that's going to open up. So it's going to really help the industry to move forward. In all different phases, we talk about this different segmentation of the market. And we have seen in our past cases like 9-11, when the North America hit the most, because that's where it happened. It, 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 but we were, it took us a few months to come back to the pace. In this impact, the challenge is, doesn't matter whether it is a VFR traffic, whether it is a corporate traffic, leisure, everybody's impacted. And you know, the experts are saying that come back to 2019 level, it's gonna take around 18 to 24 months. So what does that mean is that we have to start, what is the new normal? And, and it is exactly the same. Uh, when, I, when we had some conversation in start of the pandemic, uh, we were brought to the attention that maybe corporate will be the first one to bounce back because there are so many companies want their people to go back to their jobs where they have to be. But uh, countries are not opening up. So they, that thing has not worked as the so-called experts predicted. We have seen in the past, VFR traffic has very agile and they have the first one to respond. But we don't know that also now because we don't know how their economic condition will be because it's almost three and a half months. It's, it's a long patch when people are, they don't know about their future. So they don't know they have a financial might to do these travels or not. So I think we have a lot of variable uh, component in this. So uh, what, but what we, as, as what Chris says, I also have a rosy glasses, Chris, like you. I always believe that way, that we are the one, it's our responsibility, not, we, we have to bring facts to the table so that we don't daydream. But at the same time, we have to give them the optimism that we have done it before, guys. At 9-11, we thought it's, it's end, but we have done it. I think this way and, and the industry has boomed. Everything has done very well after that. So we think it's a reset button. We have to be prepared. It will be a new normal. And we have to be ready for this new normal. 
we have to leave our legacy the way we were proud of it. In the past that we have done the business like this, we have to change those. So in Thank all you. the sectors, I think it will be the same. Thanks. Uh, thank you, Raj. It was a packed question and a great packed answer. Um, Richard, I'm coming to you now. It means, it means you know that your mandates are very clear in terms of consumer protection and education are two mandates for TECO. Now, let's get straight on that. Now that the Caribbean destinations have opened up with a cautious start, European airlines have started their some scheduled flights, right? How are you looking into your current months to prepare you for the coming ones? But at the same time, um, for TICO agents, the travel agents, what kind of message you want to have for them? You've heard a little bit of it during promotes time. I was recently looking into one question was that a lot of people are working from home now and they are facing difficulties in getting their licensing to stay at home and work because you need a license. Regulatory uh, bodies have to look into that. Is there a way to get that done faster for them to work from home travel agents? And how are you helping on that? Yeah, AJ, a, a great question. There's a, there's a number of questions there, so let me see if I can try to answer them uh, fairly quickly. I, I would say right now, um, consumer confidence is is at is at a maybe an all maybe an all time low or, or certainly very low. And what we really need to work on uh, in the coming months is trying to reinstill that consumer confidence, uh, uh, rebuild the trust in the whole supply the whole supply chain. Uh, and the way we're doing that is taking a, a leadership position and being um, available to consumers to, to be able to answer questions, to work with our registrants, to work with our agencies, uh, to be flexible. Uh, we're extending our, our timelines and in, in require, filing requirements, uh, our, our fee requirements. Um, we're, we're looking at all options to um, try to assist our registrants work as effectively as they can with consumers. And at the same time, we're, we're talking to consumers about how so important the travel agency chain, uh, distribution chain is. In today's complex world, um, with what's going on with COVID, you need that travel expert, that travel advisor to work with consumers to try to help rebuild that confidence. Um, and so we, uh, we, we see a tremendous role moving forward for the travel advisor and we're trying to work through our own communication programs, our education, and working with registrants to um, make um, their interaction with uh, TICO as the as the regulator as efficient as possible. So there, we've we've uh, we've done some changes already uh, recently. Uh, we're we're working on some more. Um, I believe there'll be some more announcements uh, in the not too distant future. Um, but I think at long term, it's really about rebuilding that trust and that confidence. Um, you know, looking at innovation and really working collaboratively across the supply chain. Um, but we'll, we'll get through this. I'm convinced we will. No, oh, thanks. Uh, thanks on that, Richard. I really appreciate that. Means um, now move to India. Means Air India has done repatriation flights for Canadians which are stranded in India, bringing them here. Sandeep, that's coming to you. And you took Indian nationals which were coming from uh, which were stranded in Canada to take them there. That is such a great step. So as Indo-Canada Chamber of Commerce, we salute you for that. We thank you for making sure this gesture of repatriation is actually showing and strengthening the bilateral relationship between the two nations. So we thank you for that. But I want to take you back into quickly that Air India has been on and off into Canada. Now, with COVID-19, the world is shut down and we understand that. Is Air India is coming back sooner than later. Once the repatriation flights are over, how quickly will there be plans to bring the flights, at least maybe two flights a week or something, to Canada? Sandeep. Um, Ajay, there has been an announcement today that uh, you know we are considering opening up by 30th of June. But uh, personally, my feeling is that it is a bit too soon. And uh, as far as the Canadian market goes, you see, we stopped operation way back in 2012. And to a certain extent, it was a commercial decision because uh, at that time, the profile of the traffic was not what it is today. You know, that our yields uh, during those days were low because we were unable to fill up our uh, premium class uh, cabins, and uh, which has changed drastically over the years. In, the, when, in fact, uh, uh, when I came to Canada, I was very pleasantly surprised that we were filling up even our business class and first class seats. 
This is because the, our Indian community has progressed so well there in uh, Canada and their children, they have settled so well that today there are people who can very well afford business class and first class travel. So we started with three flights when we uh, launched the station. Or rather, I would say relaunched the station. We started with three flights. And come this summer scare, we were going to go for daily. The flights were in the system and were being sold. And the response was great. Pandemic, this pandemic which came along was very, very unfortunate. And that is the reason why you know everything came to a standstill. Still, in spite of that, see the, the great opportunity can be just seen from the number of flights that we operate during the evacuation period. And all those flights went absolutely chock-a-block. Seats were so difficult to come by for the normal passengers. So I am pretty optimistic that once we get a grip over this pandemic, that Canada market is one market which Air India will really look forward to. And we will be only increasing our flights to Toronto and maybe look at some other destinations like Vancouver too. And uh, I am very optimistic. That's that's you just gave us uh, what we needed. But for you and for Canada, for Canada, India is the second largest market. Of course, after transport, we can say domestic as well. But after UK, India is the second largest market. So thank you very much. That's that's very very optimistic for everyone. Why showing more promise that fortunately or unfortunately, you know, now even US has been uh, coming down with various barriers, you know, for people traveling. So and next to US. When, you know, once U.S. is closing up, Canada is opening up as a huge opportunity for each segment of travelers. So I can only see business to Canada just going up. That's wonderful. That's wonderful. Thank you. Thank you, Sandeep. Um, Chris, thank you very much. Uh, Chris, you have been looking after, like covering everything. You were just stranded in India as well. But you know that one sector which I always look into is the tourism part which strengthens the government as well and also supports a lot of um, ancillary uh, drivers which are there from restaurants that's where the tourism grows usually their booking window is between 12 to 18 months that's where they look into now in your opinion what can tourism boards and the destination um, marketing companies can plan for COVID-19 because right now all the islands have already started opening up because Canadians have always loved to go to the islands, but right now they are not having quarantine. So that's a good thing. Will there be, and what can the tourism boards be doing and how can they attract Canadians to start flying to those destinations to start with and later to exotic destinations like India as well? Well, of course you're, you're, you're right, AJ, that the Caribbean islands that are so reliant on, on tourism have started opening up very quickly indeed, but also very, very modestly. Um, the numbers are, are tiny. Uh, I was listening to the uh, Minister of Tourism for Jamaica this week, who was talking about their first week's experience of opening up um, to the world. And they had a total of 3,000 travelers. That's it. Um, and many of those were visitors, friends and relations, VFR. Um, so it's going to come very slowly. His estimate, for instance, is that they will only get back to 50% of the tourism um, levels by 2022, and that's to 50%. Um, the um, other opinions I've, I've heard um, range from three to five years, for instance, uh, to get back to, to current levels um, from Skift, which is a, a well-known industry um, website. I think tourism boards can do a lot to encourage early adoption. I think one of the great um, silver linings for the Canada-India traffic is the strength of the VFR traffic. That is going to be the segment that travels first uh, and most fully. And, and that's obviously going to be enormously useful in this context. One of the, the great barriers at the moment is travel insurance. Uh, and Richard may want to, to, to pitch in on this. I mean, it's very difficult when the Canadian uh, government has got a travel advisor against all travel which essentially, as I understand it, invalidates much of the uh, travel health insurance. Most Canadians, and particularly, I think, um, most Canadians that are perhaps within the baby boomer market are going to be very reticent about traveling anywhere without coverage for, for travelers' health insurance. So one of the things I think some tourism uh, inbound destinations are looking at is how can we proactively provide some kind of measure of, of 
uh, insurance for travelers coming into the country. Um, and the other things I think are, it's, it's going to require a lot of flexibility because things are going to be changing um, day to day and week by week. At the moment, obviously, Canada still has a, a two-week quarantine for anybody coming back in. That's a big barrier. Uh, we're going to need to know uh, what the uh, rules and regs are for any travelers for both countries, receiving and giving countries, and how they're going to change uh, going forward. So uh, I think it's, it's challenging, I think particularly for long distance, but I think the, the, the great silver lining, as I say, for the Indian-Canadian travel is that visiting friends and relations market. Also, if I could just add on a personal note, um, I wasn't nearly stranded in India because I didn't quite get to India. I was actually on a cruise ship in the middle of the Indian Ocean when all the doors came crashing down um, in the middle of March. And we were steaming rapidly towards uh, southern India and hoping to see southern India and uh, Mumbai. And uh, of course, India had to close its doors very, very quickly, as did every other Indian Ocean port. Uh, we were very lucky to get back through Oman in the end, and, and thanks to the hospitality there. But there, for instance, is a whole, in this case, cruise ship full of people who had booked, wanted to go to India, were thwarted in doing so, and I have pent up demand for India. So, you know, there's a nice little market that, uh, that India could perhaps be looking at. All those people who got so close and yet so far. <laughs> no, thank you. Uh, thank you on that. Like I said, I means uh, India is still a great market. And when you mentioned about Jamaica, we were here with the last Prime Minister, Portia Simpson Miller, and she's a great ambassador for tourism to make sure that that is pushed. So, a lot of islands are there. So, I look forward to those discussions. You, Raj, I'm going to come back to you on a very day-to-day um, -day on technology part question as well. Now, the OTAs, which we call them the online travel agents, they have been sort of challenged on daily basis on how they can book and how they can move forward, mom and pop shops or the agencies which are there. Now, what will be the role of consolidators in the coming months for these agents, especially the OTAs, where you are the supply chain for them? And a question that comes directly to you as Mondi Group being the largest in the world. Would you be now relying on the technology to be your driving force? Or will you go back to the traditional style on face-to-face -to, -face to make sure the confidence, the face-to-face -face can be virtual today? How will you make sure to enhance the confidence with the travel agents, which are actually right now depleted with every fund they have? You, Raj. First of all, uh, we work on all the markets, including OTAs, very rightly said. And as everybody is impacted, so do OTAs are. But if you, if you really see that, our overall business is segmented very well. And uh, small agencies are very big contribution to our overall revenues. And that's why our full focus in the mass program is towards them. What we think is in the going forward way, we have to adopt a new way of interacting with our customers. So if I'll take, I don't know how much time we have, but if I'll take, the customer's requirement is also changing today. In the past, customers used to walk down to your agency and used to come spend some time. They don't have that time. They don't want to make multiple calls. They want to get to know what is best available for them as soon as possible. And more importantly, sometime in their own way, how they want. So what this is going to do is it's going to give an opportunity for everybody to be a fair play. There is no monopolization by the OTAs in the past, which has, I think it's, it's a, it's, as I said, it's a reset time. So everybody will have a fair chance who will think a little bit ahead of the curve and see how they can make sure they are their current database of customers and new what they can reach out to. Certainly the ways are gonna change. Uh, we have an initiative through a product called Trips in which there is, there is an instant interaction with the customer through the innovative technology. And uh, our CEO is, is a firm believer that you know anything we can sell online, but there is a human impact to it. And that human impact take it to a next level. Even if you buy today a hotel pre-COVID or anything, whatever you buy, what you look first thing on it, reviews. And why you look reviews? Because you believe in people who have already experienced it. Now just think of a strength of a travel agent who has that experience, can use that tool and give that instant messaging to the consumer. That could be amazing. So I'm not just talking about one tool, but we have multiple processes and tools in place for our industry, for our agents to use so that they can enhance their knowledge beyond their initial reach and spend across. 
they have to look into these new ways to work and and we will be standing with them all the way perfect uh, thanks uh yuvraj on that uh richard i'm coming to you no means nobody has uh, new what is going to happen next as per iata that's what they looked into iata have already said that we will be looking into 2019 figures to come back in probably 2023 that is what their anticipation is that was last week now what in your crystal ball tells you for the travel agent especially and i'm wanting to know how can they be helped right now not just mentorship which you have mentioned in the past as well how can there be financial help coming for the travel agents to make sure they can boost their morale and get faster on track back on track richard what is the, what this travel recovery uh, time frame is going to look like and of course um, a couple of my uh, colleagues on the panel mentioned the vaccine um, when that comes that's going to be a whole new uh, ball game at, at that point but we can't uh, we can't bank on that uh, coming too soon we can't wait for it um, we're hearing anywhere from uh, a year on the most optimistic side uh, in our view what we're hearing from our uh, member registrants is we're not going to see returning to uh, 2019 levels until the very late latter part of 2021 likely into 2022 and uh, so what we're working on right now is to see what additional uh, financial flexibility we can provide to uh, to our registrants be that patient uh, helpful regulator that uh, that we is our modus operandi and try to support our registrant community so that they can weather through this storm until that vaccine comes and with consumers it's all about communication education reassurance that we'll get through this uh, and and not to lose faith in the benefits of working with uh, with a, a travel agency or tour operator Thanks, uh, Richard, on that. Uh, Sandeep, I have a question which we had looked into in January for Air India. Now, January, Air India was already in crisis, major crisis. They were about to go on sale. It's a question, means if you may be able to answer, what is their status now post-COVID? How is the government going to be helping them to stay afloat? And the viability of their operations coming into Canada, and you thank you for announcing already, hopefully in Vancouver, but their financial stability right now, how are they looking? Uh, can we unmute Sandeep, please? Sandeep, please, from the beginning, thank you. Am I audible now? Yeah, perfect, go ahead. Uh, the government has been very keen to diverse Air India and privatize it. But again, you see with uh, the current situation, things have again turned a little uncertain. But uh, in my view, uh, I firmly believe that, you see, even if it is government ownership, if it is, if it continues the way it is now, Air India can survive and Air India is not going to go down. Definitely, Air India is uh, the pride of India and the government is going to sustain it, even though they have not um, given a very definitive uh, plan about it, other than divesting it. But... Uh, Certainly, it is a too prestigious an airline, a national carrier for the government to just let it go. If we are unable to get private investment, the government will sustain it. I have to that. Air India is going to be there. Trade, as far as Air India is concerned, to just rest easy. That it's not just going to hold up like two airlines who have done in the recent past. And uh, my recommendations or my personal view is that, you know, the government can keep the ownership and professionals to run it, you know, take a change from the past uh, ways of doing business, the way government goes into it, that they want to own the airline also, and they want to run it also. You know, so they may own the airline, but give it to professionals. And we have a very good team as of now, but then there are certain gaps which need to be filled up. And uh, that is what makes me very optimistic because we have a very, very good team. And um, in my 32 years of service, I have interacted with uh, the staff and uh, of many other airlines. And we have been handling many other airlines. And most of them, they have been very, very appreciative of our services. 
so there is no doubt or you know about the quality of service that our uh, employees offer it is only that you know they have to be given the right direction and uh, i am sure that with a professional team if the government decides to uh, to uh, carry on with ownership and decides to give it to a professional team airline will do well but i can assure you one thing that the airline is not going anywhere it is going to survive well, I, I thank you on behalf of every Indo-Canadian which wants Air India to be flying here. And also, I'm sure everyone on the panel wants that too. So thank you very much. Great answer. I'll switch to now back to Chris. Chris, I have a very good question to you. It means you just mentioned you were on a cruise, right? So cruise customers are very loyal customers by history. And that has been proven in the travel industry over and over again. And even expanded recently for days and literally weeks onto shores and they were not allowed to land in back into Canada. You think, will they be the first one to jump back onto the bandwagon when the cruises come into light or will they be the last one? And that will be your question to end as well. So, well, thanks, AJ. Um, I mean, the cruise industry. You ask that question, so. <laughs> <laughs> the cruise industry is, is in a very interesting situation. You are absolutely right that um, people who cruise, cruise a lot, uh, and they're very loyal, and they will be looking for an opportunity to come back. But, and it's a big but, um, a cruise ship uh, environment is not the place to be uh, with an outbreak of a virus. And, and the news headlines uh, show that uh, around the world. Somewhat unfairly, because it was a very limited number of, of, of outbreaks on ships. And most, like ours indeed, were, were entirely uh, virus free. However, the environment is such that you've got you know, up to five, 6,000 people in a very confined space. You can't social distance in that, in that space. You simply can't. And I don't think cruisers are going to be uh, very happy about wearing masks the entire time on, on vacation. That's just a non-starter. So uh, I think the, the cruise industry, rather like my, my more general observation, it's going to take a lot longer than they currently think to come back. Many of the cruise lines were, were starting up with, with dates in June, July, and they all postponed it. It's been pushed back to September, October, some destinations until 2021 already. That's going to be pushed back still further, and they're going to have to rethink the product in, entirely. So it, it's a challenge when you have these mega ships that are being launched at a time when I think the whole industry is going to move to a more personalized service. And, I think this is going to be one of the silver linings of the post-COVID world, is that travel is going to be much more of a personal experience than, than it's been in the past. I think people will shy away from the, the large mass tourism destinations. We are beginning to see some, some concern about over-tourism. Again, a silver lining of the post-COVID world is, I think solutions will have to be found to, to those, uh, those areas. I mean, even places like the Taj Mahal, perhaps. Um, certainly, it's interesting that this week, Machu Picchu in, in Peru, another world, world-class destination, has just limited their number of daily visitors to a quarter of what uh, they had before. And we're going to see a lot more of that. So I, I think there are some real challenges for the three mega cruise line uh, organizations. But I'm confident that they will do, as our panelists have been saying, they will see this as an opportunity for reinvention, for innovation, and certainly the loyalty of those multiple uh, cruise passengers will stand them in good stead. Maybe not this year, maybe not even next year, but in the years to come. Oh, thank you. Thank you, everyone. It's amazing. On that is that a survey was done by IATA in June, which actually echoes with everyone's uh, sentiments and the voice, voices that you have said that when they run the survey, 80% of the passengers or potential travelers have said they would only consider to fly once there is a vaccine available. That is the key. So you have all echoed on that. So with that note, I want to thank everyone for their contribution. Amazing questions. We're still not done yet. We will move on to our Q&A from uh, the audience which are coming in to us. And um, let me ask those questions coming to you already. Um, one question is, which is coming uh, straight to uh, uh, Richard. Richard, in terms of um, asking from the agents right now, the, um, the money that is collected from the agent coming into 
going into the compensation fund. They have asked, can it not be shifted on to the passengers? If I may take you back history into late 90s, when um, um, Netherlands started to put the voice tax, they actually added on to the ticket. So when you add it onto the ticket, those 30 cents or 40 cents, it hardly makes a difference. It goes back onto that. How are you looking into those um, to help the uh, agents? Yeah, great, great point. Uh, um, as, I, as I mentioned earlier, um, we're leaving no stone unturned and we're looking at all ideas in terms of uh, regulatory reform. Um, as some of your viewers may recall, there was some, uh, an end to end reform, uh, review of the act was, was completed and just before uh, COVID hit, we were very close to, to making some sweeping changes. The idea of a, of a consumer pay model to try to rebuild the, uh, rebuild the, uh, the fund uh, to levels uh, needed to, to uh, support situations like we're in now has been tabled many times. And what I would say is those discussions um, are continuing at the, uh, at the Ontario government level. Um, and we're looking at all options available as to how we can um, continue to ensure that the fund remains the cornerstone of our, uh, of our consumer protection. Absolutely. Thank you. I have one more question. We don't have time. We already way past our time. Uh, that is coming to uh, Sandeep uh, on uh, Air India's pricing, which is going to be very important for customers. They've already asked me on that. Right now, they paid 2400 for the repatriation because these were charter flights coming in. In scheduled flights, will there be a major price increase coming in, especially knowing that you will have new measures in place at the airport? Social distancing might be impl uh, imposed onto the customers. What is your thoughts on that so that the customers can understand what they are waiting for in store for them? Well, Ajay, the, definitely there would be a <clears throat> You see, the government, uh, Indian government regulatory bodies are pretty firm that they would not let it go out of control. So um, having said that, uh, regarding your social distancing and all, I personally do, I am not very much in favor of social distancing within the aircraft because it really doesn't make much sense. You know? So, at least from that angle, it will not affect the pricing too much. But yes, the airlines also have to, you know, sort of uh, uh, balance out their balance sheet. So, some increase in pricing would definitely be there. That it just makes logical common sense. And uh, but uh, considering the uh, the environment, the, the regulations and under which we operate out of India. Uh, I can assure you that it won't be something which is something, you know, uh, astronomical or exorbitant. So, but the customers would have to be prepared to pay more. No, oh, thank you very much. Thank you very much uh, for sure. I want to thank every one of you uh, for participating today. I wish we can carry on this discussion till late evening because there are so many questions coming to me from my phone uh, on various channels right now. But I want to thank everyone. Thank you, Richard. Thank you, Sandeep. Thank you, Chris, and thank you, Yuvraj, from all over. You have been there, Sandeep and Yuvraj, at different time zones, especially as Sandeep. So, and also, last but not the least, my colleague, uh, uh, Pramod. Then, can we run the slides uh, quickly for me, uh, Karen, so I can uh, wrap it up? But if you can say goodbye right now, this is the time from everyone. So, thank you very much. I just want to uh, thank today our partners, which are there. But just stay on call with me for a moment. But. I want to thank our technology partners, Tangentia, which, with whom we started these web series, and they've been our partners. Thank you, Karen. Thank you, Vijay, and the entire team of Tangentia. Thank you very much. Let's move to the next one. We want to thank our lead sponsor, CIBC, and our gold sponsor, Turkish Airlines, our silver sponsor, TD, and our bronze sponsor, ICICI Bank, and Peter and Paul. Thank you very much for your support all these years. Move to the next slide, please. Our uh, sector sponsors, they create major support to us. Royal Bank of um, uh, Canada, we've got SBI from India, TELUS, which is our telephone uh, partner, J Raymond James, Seneca College, and Global T20 Cricket. They'll be coming out next year. We had an interview with them. Weekly Voice, Punjabi uh, Channel, as well as Channel Y, are our media partners. We want to thank them. And I want to remind once again to please get in touch with our chamber for your membership. Make sure you connect with us for our small business assist program. And today's webinar, if you have any feedback, please go ahead regarding questions about any, any panelists, please send it to us. Remember, Chamber is one of the oldest organization here for Indo-Canadians, and it is here to make sure support you at this particular time. Do get in touch with us. If you have any questions, write back to us on ICCC and ICCConline.org. 
Thank you, Pramod. Thank you, Richard. Thank you, Sandeep. Thank you, Chris. And thank you, Yuvraj. And thank you to the whole team. And we will see you on 9th of July back again. Happy Canada Day and happy 4th of July in the US. Thank you very much, gentlemen, thank and you. to all our listeners across the world. Thank you, Ajay. Thank you, Ajay. All the best.